Well, a couple of new songs this morning, and you can always tell that the choir's been working on them because when they start singing them, they're fit to be tied, right? They have such joy in leading us. Can you help me thank our choir and those who lead us each week? Man, thankful for, for them putting in the work to learn those songs and teach them to us, and, and uh, always fun to watch them kind of roll it out and say, finally, we get to sing this. We've been practicing it, and so it's neat to see. I'm also thankful for the young man who played the piano and showed off his gift. Pastor Tom talked about the farm league. I I remember my first sermon in big church. I was 16 years old. My uncle was pastoring a church. It was Youth Sunday, and he let me preach the sermon. I had a three, I had a, no, no, I had a spiral notebook. It was one of those big school, in fact, I think it was my math notebook for school, and I flipped to the back because I didn't do much math in it. And, uh, and uh, that's a different story. And, uh, and I wrote the sermon out and uh, got to the church and they, they, they let me preach, you know. And I got up there behind the pulpit and I, I preached. And, man, I preached and I preached and I preached. And I got to the end and I think it was about five minutes long. And so I just redid it again uh, and then prayed. Now, for those of you that have been a part of Brushy Creek for a while and you've uh, gotten to watch me pastor here for about two years, you realize I ain't preached a five-minute sermon since I was 16, right? Uh, If you have your Bible this morning, take them out, turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. We are working our way through this first book of the Bible, and today we come to a story that will leave us just jaw slacked. We will we will read a story and think, man, how bad can it get? How awful can people behave? In fact, I would submit to you this morning that, that one of the frustrations in the Christian faith, one of the things that, that I think we battle with the most is the fact that we know better and yet we sin. That the shame and the guilt of a believer who knows what sin is, who knows they shouldn't do it, and yet we do it again and we feel the, just the weight of it. We feel the shame of it. We feel the, almost the brokenness of, am I ever going to get past this? Am I ever going to get over this? Am I ever going to win this victory? Why do I keep falling into sin? Why do I keep doing this over and over and over In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul has this same argument with himself and with those that are reading it. He will say in Romans chapter 7, verses 15, and then there in verse 19, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do I want is what keep on doing. I keep doing the wrong thing. I don't want to do it. But I keep doing it. And deep down, I know it's wrong, but I have a problem. I have a sin issue. And usually what happens to the believer, to the follower of Christ, to the one who has come to the Lord, they've been forgiven of their sins. They've seen Jesus high and lifted up. They know that their life has been changed. They know the Spirit of God dwells in them. They know that God is good. They have tasted and seen. And yet when we fall into sin, there is no guilt like that, is there? Just a shame, a pitifulness. You, you might be here this morning and you would be so bold, please don't do this, but you would lift your hand if I were to ask, man, have you ever just kept on sinning and you feel terrible about it? You say, Pastor, I, I, you're describing me. Well, brother or sister, I don't want to let you feel like you're the center of attention. I'm describing all of us. I'm describing all who walk with the Lord. We fall into this sin and we feel guilty. Now, we must understand something. Even in the Apostle Paul's writing in Romans chapter 7, He is not advocating that somehow it's an excuse for sinning. In fact, in that same chapter, he would say, should we go on sinning and let grace abound? May it never be. We shouldn't go on sinning and just keep falling on the grace of the Lord as some badge of honor to keep doing whatever we want to do. That's not how we are to live. In fact, the Apostle John would tell us in 1 John chapter 5 that we are to overcome sin. That because we are in God, we have overcome the world, we have victory. We shouldn't be living in sin. And so the question this morning is, how do we do it? How do we break, how do we go past, how do we move over the cycle of falling into sin over and over and over and over? Well, I think in Genesis chapter 16, we will find again the narrative of Abraham and Sarah. We will see that their life once again will fall into sin. They will fall into turmoil. And I think we can see from their example some evidence, some truths, some ways in which we can guard against falling into sin. We can stop falling into the schemes of sin and the plans that we have and the cycle of sin. If you have your Bible this morning, take them and look with me to Genesis chapter 16. 
I'm going to read the text to us, and then we will walk through it together. And I want you to see this morning, if I were to just title this sermon, Schemes, Shortcuts, and the Cycle of Sin, how we fall into the same thing. This is centuries ago, some of the very first humans that walked the earth, and yet you will see in chapter 16 the same patterns that we see in our own life. Though the examples may be different, the actual acts of sin may be different, it will show up very, very similar to our life. Genesis chapter 16. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, now for those of you that may not be following along, Abram will become Abraham soon, so you'll hear those names interchange when people speak of him. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female ser- uh, Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar, and Sarah said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abraham, her husband, as a wife. And he went to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked at the contempt on her mistress. And Sarah said to Abraham, or Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by the spring of the water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarah, Where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing my mistress Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He, ha- he shall be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. I'm at verse 13. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God of seeing. For you said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Ber Laharoi, and it lies between Kadesh and Baird. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Let's pray together. Father, this morning, Lord, we are uh, continuing through this book of the Bible, and we know, Lord, that, that the Bible tells us, the Scripture tells us, that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. And so, Lord, Father, we pray right now you'd help us. Uh, Use me as your servant. Use, Father, work through the power of the Spirit to apply it to our eyes and our hearts that we would see how this text of of ancient antiquity, Lord, of a polygamous relationship and a child that's not an heir and a husband and wife who fall into sin, this, this narrative story of Abram and Sarah, Lord, show us how it matters to us. Lord, what does this mean to us? What, what do we learn from this? How do we, how do we see you and your mercy and your grace? How does this point us to Christ, our Savior? Lord, help us. Help us bridge the gap, Lord. Help us to see the truth of this, of this scripture, Lord, that is living and breathing. Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that we must do when studying the Bible, and this is uh, what we would refer to in in the study of the Bible as the the, the discipline or the doctrine of hermeneutics. It's the idea of understanding what did the text mean then, uh, and then what does it mean for us today? I've said this to you often, and I will often say it to you throughout our time together, is that the text, the scripture, it can't mean what it never meant, right? That's the best English I got, right? It can't mean what it never meant. We can't look at this passage and all of a sudden just pull out some meaning if it wasn't in the passage to start with. So we have to understand what does this mean. And I realize that as we read this passage and we understand it, there are things here culturally that make no sense to us. They've long been taken out of our culture and the way in which we live. It's been a long time since the the world in which we grow up in, especially here in the Western culture, knows anything of servants, knows anything of polygamy, knows anything of of children out of wedlock to the wife that you were given as your first wife. So, So I understand that that there is a huge gaps in the context. 
And then I also understand this, and I don't want, to miss, I don't want you to miss this. When I get done today, you still got to go live the Christian life. And so the question we must wrestle with is how does the story of Abraham and Sarah and Ishmael and Hagar some thousands of years ago in this sinful polygamous relationship help me live the Christian life tomorrow, right? That, that's the big question. And so I hope this morning, as we study God's word, you will see in the story of Abraham and Sarah that they have fallen once again into the schemes, into the plans, into the shortcuts they chose with their own wisdom, and that has them spiraling in the cycle of sin. And for us, the cycle of sin works the same way. When we shortcut God's will, when we scheme in our own wisdom, when we try to do things our way, when we live by the philosophy of I, me, and self, then we're going to fall into the cycle of sin. Now, your sin may not look like polygamy. Your sin may not look like children from a second wife or another spouse, but it's still sin in itself. And so this morning, my hope is, is I will show you through the narrative what sin does, and then I will show you application of how to battle it, how to grow in the Lord and not fall into the cycle of sin. So let's begin at the beginning. Truth number one, I want you to see the problem of sin. I want you to see the root cause of sin. What is, what is sin? What does it come into this story? How, how do we define it? What is, the, what is the bedrock of this? Now, for context, let's make sure we remember the story of Abram. In chapter 12 of Genesis, God comes to Abram and speaks to him and says, Abram, I want you to leave your land, your people, your property, your family. I want you to take your wife, Sarah, Lot, your nephew, who you're raising because your brother has passed away. Take any of your servants, take any of the cows and things that you own, leave your home country, leave your family, leave everything you know, and start walking to a land I will show you. This is chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. And he starts to walk towards the promised land, the land of Canaan, what would be Israel for us today. And so he begins to walk trusting the Lord. He has faith in the Lord. He is just boldly putting one foot in front of the other, going where he's never gone, following a God that's called him out of his family. He leaves behind his security. He leaves behind his farm. He leaves behind his mother and his father, his inheritance, and he follows the Lord. So when you read chapter 12 in the first few verses, you see Abram as this man of great trusting faith. And then in the middle of chapter 12, a famine hits. They go down into Egypt. He's worried about his wife getting taken from him because she's so beautiful. And he's worried that they will kill him and take his wife. So he convinces his wife down in Egypt. He gets to scheming again on his own. He gets out on his own wisdom. As my mama would say, he's way out on his skis right now. He's not doing well. And he decides to tell everybody in Egypt that his wife is his sister, hoping they won't kill him and take her. The problem is the story goes too well because Pharaoh shows up, sees that she's beautiful, gives Abraham a dowry price for her and takes her as his wife. So now he's given away his wife because of his scheming, the cycle of sin. Now the Lord rescues Sarah out of Pharaoh. He brings her back to Abraham. They leave Egypt and in chapter 13 and 14, they repent of their sin. They worship God. They are reminded that God rescued them out of Egypt. They had no reason to be rescued, but God did that. They come back into the promised land. They make an altar. They worship the Lord. They are sitting on it. And then you get to chapter 15. And God comes down and makes a covenant with Abraham. He literally lays open animals from the altar. And God says in chapter 15, if I don't keep my promise, may I, God, be cut open and die like these animals on the altar. That's how serious God is at loving and taking care of Abraham. Now you would think, brothers and sisters, that if you were Abraham and you went down into Egypt and you made a royal mess of your life, and you came out of Egypt, and God rescued you, and God loved you, and God appeared to you, and God said, Abraham, you can trust me. I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you offsprings. And in fact, if this doesn't come true, may God himself die. Now, we know God cannot die. That's how sure this promise is. Now, you would think that Abraham would never again have a faith crisis. You would think that Abraham would be sure and not fall into sin again. But then the Bible says there in your Bible, look there in chapter 16, verse 1, now Sarah. Now the word now here is important. It is reminding us we are in a new episode of this story of Abram and Sarah. 
It also is important because in the book of Genesis, we have no concept of the moving of time. We don't know how much time passed between chapter 15 and 16, but somewhere between the holy moment of 15 where God is speaking to Abraham and they're having worship and God appears to Abraham in a smoking pot and a flaming uh, torch, that somewhere between there and chapter 16, they fall again into schemes. Now I want you to see verse 1. Now that you understand the story and the background, look at what happens in verse 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had bore him no children, and she had a female servant whose name was Hagar. Now, we understand now that sin is about to come in. The author of Genesis, Moses himself, is recording this story to make sure we understand what's going on. This is the third time that the barrenness of Sarah is mentioned. Sarah has a faith crisis. She has a dilemma. She is facing a promise where God said, I'm going to give you the promised land, and and that seems to be taking place. Abram has set himself up. His farm is growing. His kingdom of Israel is growing. He leaves Egypt with all kind of uh, cattle and stock and resources. And so the promise to get the land is happening right before their eyes. But the promise to have a child is not happening. And years and years and years go by. At this point, they've been in the promised land over a decade. Over a decade, God said, I'm going to send you to a land and give you offsprings. So 10 more years of their life have passed, and she's yet to have a child. So she is facing a crisis. So here's what I would submit to you this morning that the problem of sin is. Here's the root cause of all sin in your life and in my life. We simply don't believe God. We don't believe God. All sin is a lack of trust in God. All sin is a lack of obeying and believing that his way is right and good and that he will take care of us, he will watch over us, that his plans are perfect, that his will for us is the right and perfect will. All sin is looking at God's ways and words and determining we know what's best. Sin is simply not believing God. The Apostle Paul would make this argument in Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Which literally means if we do anything without trusting the Lord, we are sinning. You know why this verse is so powerful? Because it gets rid of your do's and don'ts list. Well, if I don't do this, I'm okay. If I do this, I'm okay. That's not what the Apostle Paul says. The Apostle Paul says, whatever we don't do and whatever we are supposed to do, it must start with trusting in the Lord. It must start with obeying the Lord. You can do church and still be in sin by not trusting the Lord. You can not do something that the world or the Bible would call immoral and still be in sin because you're not trusting the Lord. Sarah is faced with a problem, and instead of trusting the Lord, she begins to scheme on her own. Sin is declaring, God, I will do what's best. Name any sin, and at the root of it is not trusting in the Lord. Name the sin of greed. Greed is the Lord, I I don't think you'll take care of me, so I'm going to cut corners and pile up. I don't believe you'll really watch over me, so I'm going to cheat a little here and cheat a little there and go claim money that I dropped at church that ain't mine. That's what I'm going to do. I'm just making sure we get that cleared up, right? (laughs) I tried to claim it, but I don't ever go up those stairs, so I couldn't think about it. Think about the sin of lust, fornication. God, your plan for marriage and intimacy between a husband and wife, that's not good. I don't trust it. I'm going to do it outside of that. Maybe in marriage. God, this idea of commitment to lifelong marriage to one spouse until death do us part, God, I don't think that's really the best way. I don't think that's really fulfilling. That doesn't give me what I want. I'm going to step out into adultery. Is it not just telling God he doesn't know what he's doing? Any sin, any place just says, think about the sin of anger. Think about the sin of getting even. Think about the sin of having retribution or jealousy. All that is is telling God the sin of covetousness. All it is is telling God, I've heard what you have to say. I've heard that I can trust you. I've heard your plan, but I don't think I want to believe it. I'll do my own. Sarah had heard over and over and over from God, you're going to be a mother and you're going to have so many offsprings, it'll be the stars in the sky. And Sarah kept waiting and waiting and waiting until finally she said, I've had enough, I can't trust God, I must do it myself. The root of sin 
is not trusting God. So what's the application for us today? Let me give you this one. The first step in battling sin is trusting God. The, the first step in battling sin is trusting God. The first step is to, is to gather yourself around God's word and say, what does God have to say and is God truthful? Is this right? Is, this the, is, is he worth believing? Is the future judgment and the coming heaven, is the rewards of following him, is it worth following him? You see, when we don't trust God, we begin the cycle of sin. Sin begins by telling God we'll handle it because we can't trust you. Number two, I want you to see the pattern of sin. I want you to see what happens now when you don't trust the Lord. Notice in this real life example what takes place when they, they don't trust the Lord. Look at verse 2, or excuse me, verse 1. It says, she had a female Egyptian servant named Hagar. No doubt this, uh, this uh, servant was given to her by Pharaoh in chapter 12, and she brings her out of Egypt with her when they, when they get expelled from Egypt. Now verse 2, and Sarah said to Abraham, behold, now the Lord has prevented me from uh, bearing children. Go into my servant that it may... Uh, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarah. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Now she has been promised a child over and over and over, but now she's determined that God is responsible for the situations he's in. She literally has the the gall and the nerve to say, God is not letting this happen, so I'm going to fix God's problem. I'm going to circumvent God, and I will do it myself. I will find my own pleasure, my own way, my own objectives. I will reach my own goals. I will do it because God can't be trusted anymore, so I must step in. Now, Let me just give a couple of words of commentary here when we look at this text. The first one is, is I want to be very sensitive to the idea of infertility. There are some of you in here that may have experienced this throughout your life. You may have experienced it with family members around you. And you understand that the idea of a husband and wife throughout Scripture is that they are to come together. And in that natural relationship of marriage, most likely, most commonly, the Lord blesses with children. But that's not always the case because we live in a fallen world and sin affects all of us. And so there are some who bear the burden of infertility. And I want to be very clear here. There is no evidence in the New Testament, there is no evidence even all the way through Scripture, that God intentionally gives infertility as a curse upon people. That it's a part of this broken world and it's a part of sinfulness. But in this culture and in this day, particularly, children were seen as honor to a wife. She would have been less than a woman until she had children in her family. The culture saw the family and the birthing of children as something that brought her identity to her. Now, we understand, brothers and sisters, and ladies, let me be very clear. We understand that our identity is not found in who we're married to or how many children we have or the job or the career or the education or the finances. Our identity is found in Christ and Christ alone, our Savior. That all our hope is in him. But in this culture, there is this place of childbearing that raises to the level where if you don't have a child, you are seen as against God, cursed by God, or separated from the will of God. And so, and again, here is one of those cultural norms that we have no understanding of. All the nations around Abraham would have practiced polygamy. They would have done this very easily and clearly. There would have been a domineering factor involved. It was very common that if a woman was not able to have a child or have enough children to build the posterity of the husband, that servants, concubines, or other wives would have been brought into it and the world would have had no uh, problem with this. The world around Abraham and Sarah would have not blushed an eye at this. They would have not seen this before. Now, recently I had the opportunity to go over to Tanzania, my wife and I with Compassion International, and see the ministry that they do. And we went into one part of Tanzania where there are still some very indigenous African tribes that are protected and they're living there. And they arrange their huts in a very simple way. There is one main hut and then there's a collection of huts around them. And every hut represented a wife. And the more huts you had, the more wives you had. There was one guy there that they said had over 25 wives. Oh, my gosh. 
I mean, I got one. <laughs> but yet, the only thing that they figured out was they all had to live in different huts. This was common to them. It was no normal in their culture. So for Sarah and Abraham, this is not outside the world around them. But let's be very clear. This is sinful. It is wrong. It goes against Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 where God established Adam and Eve and said that this man and this woman shall cling together to death. It goes against Matthew where Jesus says when they ask him of marriage that it is what he intended for one man and one woman to be together until death. This is sin. It is wrong. It is never okay. And this is where we understand when we read the Bible, there are things in the Bible. Don't miss this now. There are things in the Bible that are descriptive, telling us what happened. And there are things in the Bible that are prescriptive, showing us what we should do. This is descriptive. This is not prescriptive. We don't read Genesis 16 and make an argument for polygamy. We read Genesis 16 and make an argument for Sarah and Abraham are sinning. They're in a mess. And notice what happens. Notice what happens in their sin. Look at, look at verses 2 through 3. The pattern of sin is, I'll fix this. I'll do this myself. And so what does she do? She goes to her husband and she gives her husband, this servant girl, as another bride. Use her womb, get me what I want. Notice the words that she says in verse 2, that I may obtain a child. Now this is the pattern of sin. The pattern of sin is, I don't trust the Lord, so I'm going to do it my way and get what I want and work what I have and I desire. Sarah has no regard for Hagar, has no regard for her marriage covenant, has no regard for Abraham. She is fixated on the pleasure of her sin. I want a child. She doesn't care what will come out of it. And so we have in here this pattern. The pattern of sin is this. Once we stop trusting God and we fixate on what we want, we will crush everyone and everything in our way to fulfill our pleasure. It is a pattern that we see all through Scripture and all through our own lives. We make a wreckage of what happens. We, have, we, we make excuses. Now, now, Sarah, I'm sure, looked around at all the pagan cultures who were practicing polygamy. And I'm sure she looked at her own age, very, very advanced in years. I'm sure she looked at the fact that it's been 10 years since God made the promise and they went to the promised land that they would have lots of kids and nothing's happening. Her time is running out. Her womb is closing. She understands. And so she makes excuses all along the way and says the means or the end justifies the means. I will get my child. So she hedges on sin. Now let me just give you an application from this so that you can do this. The second step to battling sin is simply this, agreeing with God. What do I mean by that? Sarah to pull off this scheme, had to unagree, not agree, go against God and what he has said is right and wrong. So sin is not agreeing with God. When God calls sin, sin, and we call it something else, we have not agreed with God and we are not battling sin. You do not battle sin if you do not agree with God on what sin is. We do not get to define sin ourselves. We do not get to say what is right and wrong. We simply submit to the king who is over what is right and wrong, and we agree with God. The moment you stop agreeing with God, you have found yourself in sin, and the pain of sin will begin to unravel all around you. We don't get to do that. I like baseball. I grew up playing baseball. When you play baseball, there is a, a pitcher and a catcher, and there's a, a home plate, just kind of about, about three by five little thing there sitting there, and it's, it's, it's there, and then you have an umpire, and when you're batting, you, you step in there, and, and the pitcher will wind up, and he'll throw the ball, and if the ball crosses over the plate between the, the knees and the chest, and it crosses over that plate, it's a strike. If the ball crosses somewhere outside of that plate or above the chest or below the knees, it's a ball. And sometimes the umpire is blind and you've got to tell him. But it's a ball. Now, now the reason why it's a strike or a ball is because the rule book says it's a strike or a ball. There's a rule book that governs over the strike zone of baseball. Not only is there a rule book governing over the strike zone of baseball, there is an umpire that's in charge of enforcing the rule book over the strike zone of baseball. Now, I want you to think about this in the application of sin. 
There is a rule book that tells us what God desires and what he does not desire. And there is an umpire, which is the Holy Spirit, that resides over the application and the implementation and the clarity of this book. So you and I don't get to step up to the plate and argue balls and strikes. We are to agree with God on what is sin. And the moment you stop agreeing with God on what is sin, you begin the schemes and the plans to cut and curve and shave. Over the last couple of years, the sexual revolution has hit full speed. It is dark and demonic. It is from the pits of hell, and it is ruining our society and our children and everything in between. But one of the things that you will notice is you will notice that those who faithfully preach God's word for a long time who turn to now agreeing with the sins of the world, one of the things you will notice most likely in every case is that somewhere along the way in their family, they had someone turn to this sinful lifestyle. And because someone in their family turned to the sinful lifestyle of the world, then they began to have an emotional attachment. They began to move towards wanting to accept and love and care for this person And over time, because of the attachment to the child or the sister or the brother, they will soften or move or change the definition of sin along the way. You can see it in many predominant Christian writers who have found themselves agreeing with the the sexual sin of the world. And the reason for this, brothers and sisters, is that somewhere along the way, they started thinking they could redefine what God has already called sin. They started negotiating with God. They started shaving the points around. They started shifting in their agreement. And we do this all the time. You might say, well, I don't do it in that way. Shave a little bit off the taxes. Everybody's doing it. I don't have to follow all these laws. I don't have to do that. Show out a little bit at the restaurant because the manager needs to know and behave in a way that's poorly. Why? Because I need to get my way. I need to get my justice. I need to get right. I'm not trusting the Lord he'll take care of things. The world will do. This is how the world acts. Someone cuts you off in traffic and you begin to show them things that the Lord would blush over. That's how the world behaves. It's not that big a deal. Everybody does it. Sarah began to scheme because she stopped agreeing with God on what is sin. One of my favorite things to think about is simply this. When you come to the Lord Jesus, you come to a king. You don't negotiate with a king. You submit to him. Not possible. Number two, I want you to see the pain of sin. Look at what happens when we fall into this cycle of sin. Look at verse four. And he went to Hagar and she conceived. Now, went there obviously means they had relations, marital relations. They're now married together. It's so sad that she didn't get given away by her dad, she got handed over by Sarah. In fact, we can even see if you look at at that part about Sarah, it almost sounds like Adam and Eve. And Sarah saw Hagar, took Hagar, gave it to her husband. Eve saw the fruit, took the fruit, gave it to her husband, and all calamity broke loose. There's a cycle of sin, right? Our eyes see, our heart wants, we don't agree with God, and now we go and do what we want to do. And notice what happens. Just look at the fallout. Look at verse 4. And he went to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. Now Hagar's looking down on Sarah. And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be done on you. I gave you my servant to my embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked down on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarah dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. Now just notice how bad this gets. You see, in the cycle of sin, here's what happens. We, we forget, we forget now, we start to fall into it. We start to try to do it ourselves. And now what happens in the cycle of sin is that pain becomes the problem. We start to have a ripple effect. We start to fall apart. You, you remember when your mama would say to you, oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. I would always look at her and say, mama, it wasn't me lying, it was my brother. That never worked. The idea is is that once we start down the road of sin, the wreckage is awful. Notice what happens. Sarah gets exactly what she wants. Just like Abraham schemed in Egypt to get what he wanted, she got exactly what she wanted, and now it's falling apart. So what happens? Sarah's servant, Hagar, becomes pregnant. 
She begins to show. She has the glow of pregnancy. Her womb, her belly begins to grow. And now because she's pregnant and because Abraham, I'm sure, is doting over the fact that he's about to have a son, now Sarah's getting jealous and angry and Hagar's looking down on her. And Hagar was used as a means to an end, mistreated and pulled. But now she's throwing back with claws and they're fighting. And notice what Sarah has the gall to say. Sarah has the gall to say, Abraham, you did this. Now, I never heard better words in marriage counseling than I heard right there, right? I don't know whose fault it is, but it's yours, sir. You did this. In fact, she goes even further and says, the Lord knows that you wronged me. May he curse you. May he judge you. May he look at both of us and see that you did this. This And then notice what happens. Look there to, at the last part, verse 6. What happens? She starts to treat Hagar as bad as she can. She has long run past the golden rule of do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. She's long run past the idea that the people of God are to show kindness and mercy as God has shown kindness and mercy to us. She begins to treat her with contempt. She begins to treat her with harshness. She treats her so bad that she will run away into the desert headed back to Egypt. That's how bad she treats her. You see, the problem with your sin and my sin is that we forget God. We start to go out on our own. But the problem is it doesn't just affect us. It affects everyone around us. Our sin is not an isolated event. You begin to fall into sin, it will affect your relationships. It will affect your legacy. It will affect your witness at work. It will affect the way you communicate to your neighborhood. It will affect the, the vitality and the faithfulness of the body of Christ to do the work of God. Sin has ripple effects in all of our lives. And Sarah has fallen into sin. And the ripple effects are moving even further. I mean, her marriage is in trouble. She's treating people in such a way that they would run from her. She's calling down the name of the Lord in curses. This is about as bad as you can get in sin. She is wallowing in it. She is turning over in it. She is getting what she deserved. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be fooled. You will reap what you sow. Right? She's getting exactly what she did. She reaped in the flesh. She made a scheme. She made a plan. She didn't trust God. She went her own way. And now the cycle and the pain of sin is coming. She's falling apart now because of sin. She looked at Hagar with contempt. The Lord is now called on it. She doesn't live the way she's supposed to live. She is not doing well. Let me give you a third application I think that will help us here in battling sin, and that's simply this. When we battle sin, we must remember its destruction. You see, I think, I, I think brothers and sisters, that, that for those of us who know, and we know some, you know the marriage that fell apart because of adultery, you know the children that had to grow up in a single home because of drug addiction. You, you, you know the churches that fell apart because of scandal and leadership. You, you understand how the ripple effects of sin can destroy, can tear down, can burn to the ground, can cause a wildfire ablaze. I think, brothers and sisters, that if we would wake up each morning and understand how much we are to know God, trust God, love God, and also see how polarizingly dangerous sin is, it would help us not sin. I'm reminded of David in the Old Testament we took Bathsheba that was not his wife who had her husband killed when she became pregnant and it ruined his family from that point on. The sword came into his family. His sibling, his children are fighting one another. The, the kingdom begins to start to crumble all because he went up on the roof one day and started lusting after a woman that wasn't his wife. I imagine he didn't wake up that day and out of the blue decide I'm going to have an affair. I imagine it was a slow, sinful fade that turned into a ripple effect that destroyed everything it touched. Brothers and sisters, hear me with sober-minded thought. The sins that you are committing, the lack of trust that you are placing in the Lord, they are not just affecting you. They will have ripple effects for all who are around you. Sin destroys everything it touches. It will ruin everything that is good and light in the kingdom of God. Instead of turning from her sin, look at verse 5 and 6. It says in verse 5 and 6, And Sarah said to Abram, May the wrong done to me on you uh, that I gave you my servant embrace. And when she saw, she conceived, she looked at him with content. May the Lord judge between you. Now look at verse 6. But Abram said to Sarah, Behold, your servant is in your power. 
And notice what she does. She dealt harshly with him. You know what they should have done right there? When she comes in and says, Abram, I'm so mad at you. Look how pregnant she is, and I can't believe this. You know what Abram should have done? Abram should have grabbed her by the hand, fell on his knees, and said, we have sinned, and we are wrong. He should have led his wife to repent. He should have repented. He should have taken control of the situation. He should have gone before the Lord in confession. He should have turned from his sin. He should have done what 1 John 1, 9 says, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our unrighteousness. We should have done that. Instead, he abdicated his duty once again and said, well, you deal with her. And then she left and behaved even more poorly. This is a mess because of sin. Now, I could say amen and we could finish the sermon, but I think you would leave here pretty disappointed. I think you'd leave here pretty brokenhearted. So I want to finish with one final thought, and that's simply this. In this pattern of sin, there is one character we have not mentioned yet. There is one character we have not seen. We've seen Hagar get used. We've seen Sarah be abusive and scheming and sly. We've seen Abraham be a wet noodle not leading his family in the ways of God. We've seen all the mess you can see. But now I want you to see the Lord. Look with me at the last part of the text. I want you to see the grace of God. The Bible says that she flew, and now verse 7 says the angel of the Lord. Now, anytime we see this in Old Testament, it's used many times, the angel of the Lord. In most cases, scholars believe this is actually an appearance of God the Father. Some even believe that it might be Christ, the, the Son, appearing. But it is literally God appearing. This is not an angel like Gabriel. This is God appearing to them in some form where she can see him. The angel of the Lord found her by the spring of the water in the wilderness and the spring on the way to Shur. That's going back to Egypt. She's, she's running back to Egypt. And he said to Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Now he already knows the answers to this because he'll tell her things that she hasn't told him yet. She said, I'm fleeing my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I surely will multiply your offsprings so that they cannot be numbered of the multitude. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. The word Ishmael literally means God has listened. In verse 12, And he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. She names the Lord. You are the God of seeing. You have seen me. Notice what else she says. Truly here, I have seen you. Therefore, this is called Ber Laha, La Roha, and it's between Kadesh and Barid. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called his name Ishmael. I want you to just see a couple things, and we'll be through here. In this cycle of sin, there is rebellion and pain and a mess. But in this entire cycle of sin, I, I want you to see just a couple of things. The first thing I want you to see is this. God sees everything. God was keeping a record of all of this. He knew how Sarah was treating her. He knew what Abraham had done. He knew where to find her fleeing to Egypt. God sees everything. This is both convicting and ensuring or comforting. It's convicting because God sees you when you're sinning. You are not alone when you're by yourself sinning. God sees you. He keeps a record of everything. But it's also comforting because the God who sees us being mistreated, the God who sees us wanting to do what's right, the God who hears our prayers is there watching and listening and caring for us. God sees us. There is grace here. And so I think that the fourth and final step of battling sin is remembering the grace of God. Because God did not forget Hagar. In fact, he gives her a son, Ishmael. Now, we could go into a further study of Ishmael and realize that the ripple effects of Abraham's sin will go on. It still goes on today. The people of Ishmael are, are adamantly against the people of Abraham because of the sins of Abraham. But God saw and took care and watched over her, sent her back and protected her. In fact, when you go down and read the last verse, Sarah's not even mentioned. And a child was given to Abraham, which means Abraham steps in and protects Ishmael. Watches over him. So God has kept his word with Hagar. But I want you to see this, and I want you to see it very clearly. Up until this moment, Sarah and Abraham have piled up a sin resume like no one else. I mean, they have made a mess of their life. They have not trusted God. They have done their own thing. They have abused Hagar. There is a mess here. But when God comes along and picks up Hagar and says, you're going to have Ishmael, and he's going to be the father of a great nation. He's going to have lots of people, lots of names, but he's going to be different. 
He's going to be a wild donkey. He's going to be cantankerous. He's not going to live near people. He's going to be against Abraham's seed. There's going to be ripple effects for this sin, but I'm still going to bless him along the way. But I don't want you to miss this, and don't lose sight of this. Ishmael is not the offspring. And the reason that Ishmael is not the offspring is because God promised through Abraham and Sarah the offspring. The same offspring that God said that through him the nations would be blessed and there would be the multitude as in the stars of the sky or the dust on the ground. And so through Abraham's child, Isaac, which we will see soon, that one will come to save the world. Ishmael's offspring could not save Abraham and Sarah from their sin. But Isaac's offspring, through the Lord Jesus Christ, will be lifted up, die on a cross, be buried, raised from the grave, and fulfill the prophecy of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, crush the serpent's head. So all the sin resume of Abraham and Sarah will be washed away by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ through the true offspring. That's why Ishmael couldn't be the offspring, because God has promised grace. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he lovely? You see, brothers and sisters, the cycle of sin in chapter 16 ends with Christ. They made their own plans. They went their own way. They decided to scheme against God. They got entangled in pain and adultery and polygamy and and children that shouldn't have been born to them. They, They made a mess of it. But God, in his grace, is still going to give them Isaac, which is still going to birth two sons. And from one of those sons will come 12 tribes. And from those 12 tribes will come the lion from the tribe of Judah, the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so in this very story, centuries before Jesus, there is the grace of God for sin. Why is that so good for us to hear? Because you are a sinner. I am a sinner. We do make a mess. We do fall into problems. We do run from God. We are in a scheme and a web and a tangle. But there is one who has come to wash all of that away. There is one who has forgiven us all our sins. There is one who's carried all our debt to the cross. There is one who came from Abraham's loins that has rescued us. There is one from the tribe of Judah the lion. There is a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And so I would just simply say to you, if you're here this morning and you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you find yourself entangled in sin, then fall on your knees and confess and rejoice that Jesus has already washed those sins away. If you are here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not a Christian. I still carry around the guilt of my sin. I still carry around the baggage of death. I'm still carrying around the destiny of hell. Then listen to me carefully. You can lay down every one of your sins at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ and be washed by the blood of the Lamb. You can be saved from your sins. You don't have to bear the guilt anymore. You don't have to carry the shame anymore. You can be rescued by Jesus Christ, the very offspring of Abraham that came to wash away sin. God has provided an answer for our sin. And it is grace, grace, marvelous grace. Would you pray with me, Father? Hey, I'm Pastor Corey, and I just want to say thank you for worshiping with us online. It is so great that through technology you were able to join us today. I hope while you got to sing with God's people and hear his word preached, you were moved and touched by the Holy Spirit. Maybe while you were worshiping with us online, the Lord began to prompt your heart. Maybe he's calling you to make some sort of decision or follow him in a more tangible way. Or maybe you just realized you need some help and you want some other people to come along beside you and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. If that's the case, we want to help you. We want to connect with you. We want to tell you that we're a church that's here for you. There are two ways that you can contact us. First, you can click on the link in this post above the video and you'll find all kinds of ways to hear more about who we are, fill out a contact information, or put in a prayer request. Or if you'd like to, you can email the email that's coming across the screen now, prayer at brushycreek.org. If you send an email to that address, it will get to our staff, and we'll be glad to return it, to pray for you, and to care about you. It is so neat to be able to worship together from all over the world. We would love for you to come join us in person sometime, but until then, we hope to meet you here again next week.